Okay, so today we're going to continue the survey of the book of Leviticus, and we're going to focus on chapters 10 through 12 today. We ended Leviticus part 1 with a survey of the five types of offerings in chapters 1 through 6, the burn offerings, the meat offerings, the peace offerings, the offerings for unintentional sin, and also the trespass offerings. I also covered the lawful provision for priests in chapter 7, the consecration of priests in the holy garments, such as the ephod, the breastplate, and the urim and thummim in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, God's glory appeared to the children of Israel in the tabernacle, and fire proceeded out from the presence of God and devoured the whole burnt sacrifice. And while this caused great fear, the fear of God to descend into the camp, God was nevertheless pleased with the Israelites and accepted their offering. It was an acceptable sacrifice unto the Lord. Now, chapter 10, which we're going to look at today, deals with the death of Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, the priests of the tabernacle. Chapter 11, which we're also going to cover, <clears throat> deals with the food and dietary laws and restrictions. That single chapter alone covers all the debate about what we should eat and not eat. Um, and we're going to look at that in light of the New Testament and in light of the Old Testament as well. Chapter 12 covers the purification of a mother after childbirth, and we see parallels of this with the birth of Jesus Christ and the purification of Mary in the New Testament. So let's go ahead and turn to Leviticus chapter 10, and we'll begin by reading verses 1 and 2. So Leviticus 10, starting at verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So beginning in chapter 10, we see that the same fire which devoured the burnt offering earlier in the, in the very you know, previous chapter now devours the two sons of Aaron, the, the priests of the tabernacle, Nadab and Abihu. Now, of course, Aaron was the high priest, and so Nadab and Abihu would have been next in line in the succession of the high priesthood of Israel. But the same fire consumed them, whereas the, the, the burnt offering was accepted, the strange fire which Nadab and Abihu offered was not accepted to the point that it caused them their life. And so we have to be careful to be sure that what we're offering to God is acceptable in His sight and that we don't offer strange fire that can, you know, that can bring about a curse upon us or, you know, or, you know, bring upon God's discipline, basically. Um, now, go ahead and turn back to Exodus 30, and we're going to look at exactly, we're going to ask the question, what was the strange fire that the sons of Aaron offered? So, back in Exodus 30, and as we saw last time, there are a lot of crossovers between Leviticus and Exodus. You know, we looked at the holy garments of the priests, and we saw that there are a lot of, you know, all the details are, are in Exodus. So, go ahead and turn back to Exodus 30, <clears throat> and we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at the golden altar of incense that was inside the tabernacle. Now, the Bible says that the altar was made of shittim wood and overlaid with pure gold. <clears throat> so Exodus 30, starting at verse 1, <clears throat> And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, 
and thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. Now, what is shittim wood? Um, this was wood from the acacia tree, which was abundant in the Sinai Desert. And this is really just a side point, but if you look up shittim in the Bible, everything from the Ark of the Covenant to the tabernacle, I'm sorry, to the table of the showbread, to the tabernacle walls and the pillars were all made of shittim wood. So this was, this was wood that was available and it was abundant in the Sinai Desert where the tabernacle was being reared up like we looked at last time. And all of it was overlaid with pure solid gold. And um, if you look at Exodus 30, keep reading and starting in verse 6, <clears throat> It says, And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony. So it's talking about the, you know, the altar of incense is to be put <clears throat> before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. <clears throat> he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering, um, drink offering thereon. So we see that the altar of incense that the sons of Aaron were responsible for was placed inside the sanctuary of the tabernacle near the veil which separated the inner sanctuary from the outer sanctuary. So inside the tabernacle, inside the tent that they'd reared up, um, you know, you had the outer sanctuary and separating that was this veil and that veil in, you know, over on the other side of the veil was the uh, inner sanctuary where the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, as they call it, uh, was inside. And then it was overlaid with the mercy seat was over the Ark of the Testimony. And the altar of incense was laid just next to the veil on the other side in the uh, outer sanctuary. And um, this will become more important later as we get to chapter 16 dealing with the once-a-year blood atonement, which is the final blood atonement for all sin, for all people who will receive it by faith. But basically, um, you know, where all of these items were, the Ark of the Covenant was, the mercy seat was, the table of the showbread, the altar of incense, and it was, it was all stationed right there outside the veil. And there's a lot of symbolism regarding the incense, but practically speaking, it covered up the fleshy smell of the animal sacrifices that were happening daily. So that's one of the purposes, just as a practical matter, why there was incense. And it made the, the tabernacle smell more pleasant and more sweet, so it would be a sweet-smelling savor again unto the Lord. And uh, spiritually, the incense symbolized the prayers of the saints unto God. Okay, so Revelation 8, we see this, you know, we see this, you know, throughout the Bible where incense represents the prayers of the saints ascending unto God. <clears throat> but Revelation 8, starting at verse 3, it reads, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So there's a heavenly version of this in the throne of God, in heaven with God. And what we see on earth is just a, um, it's just a simulacrum, which is a replica, so to speak, of what is in heaven. It's just a foreshadowing, a representation, and a, a symbol of what's actually in heaven. And it all represents you know, the throne room of God. And um, so this altar is there, and in verse 4 in Revelation 8, 4, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. 
Okay, so we have this very clear parallel with that in Revelation 8. In Psalm 141, verse 2, it also says, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And we see this again and again in various psalms and scriptures. And in Exodus 30, starting at verse 7, God instructs Moses to burn the incense inside the tabernacle day and night continually. Okay, we just read that in Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So our prayers and our worship are ascending up to God perpetually. And he hears them as, as saints of God as we gather around and enter his throne room. Um, in the spirit. And so because the altar of incense served a very specific and holy function, any aberration, any perversion from the specific instructions could be serious enough to lead to chastisement or death. And verse 9 says, he shall offer <clears throat> no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. So we see the word strange incense applied there. So obviously Nadab and Abihu offered strange incense before the Lord. Now if you read Exodus uh, 30, starting at verse 34, it lists the ingredients, the specific ingredients that were necessary uh, for the incense that was to be burned. It was a very specific list of items that made up this incense. So Exodus 30, uh, 34, <clears throat> it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stacti, and onica, and galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense, of each shall there be a like weight. And thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation where I will meet with thee. It shall be unto you most holy. And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof, it shall be unto thee holy for the Lord. Whosoever shall make like unto that, to smell thereto shall even be cut off from his people. So it's saying that if you even use this incense for your personal use, then you, know, you will be cut off from the people. And obviously altering those ingredients would also be a major sin and it would you know, it would be considered strange fire. Now, um, we see that, a that Nadab and Abihu were cut off by God himself for offering strange fire inside the tabernacle. And as Brother Marshall pointed out in one sermon, you know, and I think that was in Galatians 1, to cut off can actually mean to be killed not just to be separated from your people. And you, know, you can look at Galatians 1 from Marshall Marcus and, and he goes into more detail on that. Now, the word strange, as in strange fire, also has certain connotations that went along with it. Consider that the first time the word strange is used in the Bible, it is associated with strange gods. And you know, that's in Genesis 35, 2. The first time, as you know, that a, uh, that a word appears in the Bible, it defines the meaning of that word throughout the rest of the Bible. That's what we call the Bible, King, you know, the King James Bible Dictionary. In Genesis 35, 2, it says, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. So strange gods, the first time that the word strange is used in the Bible, it refers to strange gods. And so we get this association in our mind 
of strange fire, strange gods, and it takes on that meaning. Um, and so that, so that the word strange is now cognitively associated with false gods. And that's the key to understanding what Aaron's sons had really done. They had used the holy incense in the tabernacle of God, in the holy you know, tabernacle. Um, they used the incense in worship of strange gods, false gods, which were abhorrent to, to God. Now, Psalm 81 also, Psalm 81, 9 says, There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. And so it was for no light reason that they were killed before the Lord. God was also establishing the ordinances and regulations for tabernacle worship that set Israel apart from all other nations. So an example was being set here. You know, the whole nation was looking to Nadab in a Abihu, and it was, it was important that they followed the specific ordinances of the, of the Lord and not offer the strange fire or alter it in any way or offer it unto a different God other than Jehovah, which they were worshiping. Now, Leviticus 10, um, <clears throat> in starting in verses, let's go back to Leviticus 10, now that you have the, some of the background for the altar of incense. And if you look back at Leviticus 10, starting at verse 3, God tells Aaron and his sons, his remaining sons, not to publicly mourn Nadab and Abihu because what, what had transpired was righteous in the sight of God. So Leviticus 10, starting at verse 3, And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering. I'm sorry, that was Leviticus 9. Let's just go back here to Leviticus, Leviticus 10. Starting at verse 3, Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Meshael and Elzaphon, the sons of Azel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, and as Moses had said. So basically, they got these cousins to come and carry them out of, carry their dead bodies out of the tabernacle where they had been struck dead, and um, and carried them in their coats out of the camp. And this was, you know, the ephod and all, you know, what they were wearing. And they carried them out as Moses had instructed. And in verse 6, And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. So we see here um, that he told that God instructed them not to uncover their heads and not to rend their clothing. And to rend is to tear. And when, you know, when, you, when the Israelites would tear their clothing, this was a public display of mourning okay, among the Israelites. It was a way to, to, to basically you know, let out your, your, your you know, sadness and, and mourn. And he says not to do this to them. He says, but to continue ministering in the service of the Lord inside the tabernacle. Okay, so, but he says, let everyone else, you know, mourn. And, but if they were not to do it because what had transpired was righteous and it was right in the sight of God. Now, after that, Moses commands Aaron and his remaining sons to take their portion of the offerings and to eat it beside the altar in the holy place because it was their due. So now the two new sons, the two other remaining sons of Aaron uh, take his play, take their place. And uh, this was the portion that we talked about in Leviticus 7. 
So let's take a look at that. Leviticus 10, starting at verse 12. It says, And Moses spake unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar. So there was, um, he spoke to Aaron and those were the, the two other sons. His sons that were left, take the meat offering that remaineth of the offerings of the Lord made by fire and eat it without uh, leaven beside the altar for it is most holy. And so this was the, the portion of the priest that we talked about in Leviticus 7. They were to take it and eat their portion. You know, basically God was saying, keep going with worshiping, you know, with worship of God inside the tabernacle. Nothing was to change after this, you know, death of Nadab and Abihu. Not a, you know, not a minute, not a second was to be spared other than letting the other people mourn. But the, the worship and the sacrifices were to go on and the priests were not to mourn this, uh, this death because it was from God. And, um, and so we continue reading Leviticus uh, 10, uh, verses uh, 12, we just read, now 13, and it says, And ye shall eat it in the holy place, because it is thy due and thy son's due of the sacrifices of the Lord made by fire, for so I commanded. And the wave breast and heave shoulder shall ye eat in a clean place, thou and thy sons and thy daughters with thee, for they be thy due and thy sons due, which are given out of the sacrifices of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The heave shoulder and the wave breast shall they bring with the offerings made by fire of the fat. If you remember, last time we talked about the wave offering, that was the portion for the priests to wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thine and thy sons with thee by a statute forever, as the Lord hath commanded. And Moses diligently sought the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt. And he was angry with, Eli with Eliezer and Ithamar, the sons of Aaron, which were left alive, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? seeing it is most holy, and God hath given it to you to bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, the blood of it was not brought in within the holy place. Ye should indeed have eaten it in the holy place as I commanded. And at this point, I would have been afraid, you know. I mean, they just, you know, they just also transgressed the ordinances of God and disobeyed Moses who was a spokesman, you know, for God. Um, but something interesting happens here. If you continue to read in verse 19, And Aaron said unto Moses, Behold, this day have they offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord, and such things have befallen me. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, should it have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? And when Moses heard that, he was content. So basically, they don't eat their portion. They, they burn it. And, you know, that was not according to the ordinances. But instead of them also now being punished, God actually, um, you know, Mo it says that Moses was content with Aaron's answer. And so what exactly happened here? Well, basically, Aaron says, look, today I've lost my sons. Okay, and if I were to eat the offering, it would have been... Um, disingenuous. It wouldn't have been accepted in the sight of God because it, it would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been heartfelt. It wouldn't have been genuine before God. It would have been, it wouldn't have been offered from the heart, but done out of compulsion. And surprisingly, even though these ordinances are so important, Moses accepts this answer, and Aaron is not disciplined for disobeying the ordinances of the tabernacle, um, and his sons are not disciplined either. This reveals something very important. Okay, On the one hand, Nadab and Abihu were struck dead for disobeying the ordinances and offering strange fire before God. But as, as I showed, that was in worship of false gods inside the tabernacle. Their heart was not right with God. 
Okay, they were worshiping another god. That's a major, you know, that's, that's a, there's a major difference there. On the other hand, Aaron also breaks the same ordinances, or not the exact same, but the ordinances, but his motives were entirely different. It was so that he could be sincere in his worship of God. Okay, so this tells us that God is not interested in empty ritual. He's not interested in the legalism of the Pharisees. You know, we have to worship God from the heart and go where the Lord tells us to go and do what the Lord tells us to do. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 15, verse 22 also says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. So this means that, you know, it's not the empty ritual, it's not the ordinances themselves that matter, or where the power is, you know, of God. It's, it's obeying God from the heart. It's being genuine before God. You know, and Aaron could not have genuinely offered, you know, that worship of God in the tabernacle that day, and his sons, and, you know, when, when his son had been killed, you know, and when his, his brothers couldn't either. Um, and so that, that was exactly it. And so we can't isolate the mechanics of all the sacrifices and ordinances from genuine worship, otherwise you have dead empty ritual. Psalm 40 also says, starting in verse 6, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Okay, so Paul quotes also Psalm 40, um, the same one we just read in Hebrews 10, where, where he says, you know, uh, then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, speaking of Jesus Christ himself. And so it's important that the law uh, be obeyed from our heart and not just out of empty uh, ritual. Of course, there are times when you don't feel like doing the right thing. I'm, you, know, you still need to, to obey the law and be good as far as you know, being moral, even if you don't feel like it. That's not the point. I'm talking about worship of, of God. Um, and just worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Uh, Psalm 51, starting at verse 16, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else, I, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And so Aaron and his sons were worshiping God with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And that was acceptable in the sight of God as they mourned their brothers privately. Now, let's, let's move on to Leviticus chapter 11. As we are in a survey here, we're not just spending that entire time. But there's so, there so much to be learned from Nadab and Abihu in that chapter. I wanted to spend a little bit of, uh, of time there. So Leviticus 11, all right, Leviticus chapter 11 deals with the food and dietary restrictions, the list of clean and unclean foods. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of controversy when it comes to, you know, to food and diet and what we can eat um, because, you know, of the, of the Jewish you know, the modern day Jewish laws, you know, the Muslims even don't eat pork, you know, but Christians are the only ones that are free to eat, you know, what we want, basically. Um, and, you know, but recently, even within the Hebrew Roots movement, that is being disputed. And so I want to talk about, you know, I want to spend some time also in chapter 11 and look at this from a perspective of the Old Testament first. And let's see what the law says. And we'll take that at face value and, and dissect that a bit. And then we'll examine the New Covenant perspective. So turn to, to Leviticus 11. And let's read starting at verse 1. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall not, which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So there are two requirements here. Just switch Bibles here. It's a little bit bigger print. All right. So Leviticus 11, um, the first three verses that we read, it, there are basically two requirements for the beasts that are on the earth. And um, for the first, you know, first portion, portion of this. And the two requirements for an animal to be clean is whatsoever parteth, sorry, excuse me, parteth the hoof and is cloven footed. This is describing the same thing. Animals that have a hoof that is split in two, such as a goat, cattle, sheep, elk, deer, the ox, the gazelle, the antelope, you know, and so on. There are a lot of animals that you, they have their hoof and it's parted in two, okay? And that's the first, uh, that's the first thing that has to be there when it comes to your, your typical mammal, you know, your cattle, your animals, um, even the wild, you know, the wild beasts that, that roam the earth. And um, the number two thing is animals that cheweth the cud. And both of these characteristics have to be present for a food according to the Levitical law, which is what we're looking at first, not the New Testament uh, covenant of, you know, the new covenant, but the Old Testament law, those two things have to be present. Now, for the farmers and ranchers out there, they automatically know exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Chewing the cud is when an animal such as a cow or a goat takes food in its mouth and they chew it, swallow it, and they begin to digest it in their stomach, and then they regurgitate it back up again and um, from their stomachs, and they, it comes back into their mouth, and they, and they, chew it a, you know, they chew it a second time, and then they digest it again. And that's the way God made those kinds of animals. And um, so those two things have to be present for an animal to be clean. It's the way their digestive system was made, and perhaps that was to break down parasites. It, it could have been for a lot of beneficial health reasons as well, that especially at the time, um, you know, thousands of years ago really would have, you know, made a difference even to the health of the Israelites. You know, you may have even heard the old saying, the old idiom, you know, chewing the cut, meaning that, you know, somebody who ponders over and reflects over something uh, before speaking, you know. Um, for example, Mark tends to chew the cud before he answers, you know, so that's where that, that idiom comes from. And in animals, it's a part of the digestion process. Like I said, ca uh, basically cattle, goats, sheep, deer, they all chew the cud. And so the pig or, the, or swine, for example, was excluded from the clean list. Even though pigs are cloven-footed, they have that split in their hoof, um, they don't chew the cud. Okay, so we see this explained in Leviticus 11, uh, verses 4 through 8. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch, they are unclean to you. <clears throat> okay, so examples of animals that we see excluded are the camel, you know, the swine, uh, the coney. And I don't think anybody here knows what a coney is. Um, the best guess that we have um, is that it's a cross, it kind of looks like a cross 
between a gopher and a rabbit, and they're found in the rocky regions of the Sinai Desert. Biblically, they're also mentioned in Proverbs 104.8, where it says, the high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. So they obviously were these little burrowing creatures that, that lived um, in the clefts of the rocks. Proverbs 30.26, the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So it's kind of this go, go for rabbit type creature um, some say that it's a small creature that comes from the same genus as the rhinoceros. You know, I don't know. There's not a lot of mention um, of them other than, than that in the Bible. Now, the hare is excluded, um, which the hare is also from the same genus or family as a rabbit. Um, and swine is, is excluded, which is a pig. As you all know, that's the obvious one. It's listed in the unclean category. And that's why Orthodox Jews and Muslims today won't eat pork. Um, they both follow still the Levitical law of Moses to this day, at least when it comes to the food laws. Now, there are a lot of laws that they don't follow, but you know, for some reason, the food laws are the ones that they, they focus on. Now, verse 9 gets into sea creatures. And basically, the only types that were considered clean among the, you know, in the seas and the sea creatures in the waters were most fish with a, just a few exceptions. So let's read verses 9 through 12. And you know, a lot of this doesn't apply today, but I just think it's interesting to, to kind of see what was listed as clean and, and what wasn't. So verse 9, these shall ye eat of all that are in the waters, whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall ye eat. All that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, and of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination unto you. Um, they shall, in verse 11, they shall be even an abomination unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses an abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the waters, that shall be an abomination unto you. So it's repeated a few times. If a sea creature doesn't have fins and doesn't have scales, then it's considered unclean. So this excludes creatures like the squid, eel, octopus, sea urchin, basically all the crazy stuff at the sushi counter, you, you know, it was considered unclean. Okay, also dolphins, whales, uh, sharks, you know, they're all excluded because they have no scales. Um, so there goes that, you know, tar that shark taco that I had at Sharky's once in, in California. It, that would have been excluded and, um, you know, because it has no fins and no scale. It has fins but no scales. Shrimp would be excluded. Crawfish would be excluded. Lobster, crab, mussels, oysters, all of these would be excluded and considered unclean according to the Levitical laws. Other fish that don't have scales include catfish and the swordfish um, because they have fins, but again, they don't have scales. Now, it's interesting that some of the scientific studies out there today claim that fish with fins and scales are equipped with a digestive system that prevents the absorption of toxins that this is how God actually made them. While bottom dwellers, like catfish, have digestive systems that are designed to absorb toxins and waste materials from the bottom of the ocean because they're bottom dwellers. Um, now, this is science, it's not, you know, it's just a study, and it, whether it's true or not, you know, there are a lot of scientific claims out there, but I just thought it's interesting that there could be some parallels um, between why it would have been considered unclean at the time. And um, now shrimp and lobster are also crustaceans, and they're designed to naturally absorb toxins from their surroundings. And, and they're also, you know, bottom dwellers um, where they're, that's what the environment they're living in. Um, and they're also part of the, the arthropod family of sea creatures, which on land includes as far as science and the genuses uh, are concerned, include cockroaches and spiders. Now, that's just their genus. You know, I don't think of a, a, a cockroach when I look at a, 
of a you know of a shrimp, um, but that's why you'll sometimes hear uh, shrimp referred to as the cockroaches of the sea. You know, if you've heard that sometimes, that's the reason because of their genus um, in in the animal ki kingdom, so called. And we'll get to um, you know um, some of the health implications a little, just a little bit more because, for example, swine at the time um, could carry parasites and you know they were unclean and so there may have been health reasons uh, for it for on the practical you know everyday type of uh, issue with that but um, that does not mean that that's the only reason there is also a spiritual component and we're going to get to that uh, also in a minute now finally as far as that's the sea creatures but finally we get to the fowls which are flying creatures, according to the Bible. So look at Leviticus 11, uh, st starting at verse 13. It says, And these are they which ye shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination, the eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, and the swan, and the pelican, and the gyre eagle, and the stork, the heron after her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat, all fowls that creep going upon all fours shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat of every flying creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap withal upon the earth. Now notice, Fowl just means flying. And so, it, biblically, fowl included birds and it included insects like grasshoppers. That's why in verse 21 it says, Yet these may ye eat of every flying creeping thing, the creeping thing or the insects, um, that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap withal upon the earth. So there are certain insects or fowl, according to, or creeping fowl, according to the Bible, that were considered clean. In verse 22, even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind, but all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. And so, of course, you know, when you think about the locust, we think about John the Baptist, you know, he was eating a clean food. So he was following the Levitical law. And so we do see that happening because he was still a, an Old Testament prophet. And we can get more into that, why I believe that. I know there are people who are split on that. But, you know, the, it really just comes down to that until the blood was shed on the cross, the blood of the new covenant was not initiated until that blood was spilled. Um, and that's, that's for another sermon. So, um, you know, we talked about John the Baptist, Matthew 3, 4. It says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And um, so that's, that takes care of the fowls. Now, further down in Leviticus 11, the Bible also lists all animals as unclean that goeth upon his paws. So in verse 27, for example, it says, And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Who's, um, whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the, ev the even. So, you know, those that go upon their paws, um, that includes dogs, cats, bears, you know, these were considered unclean animals. And in verse 29, it says, the creeping things that creep upon the earth, like the weasel and the mouse and the tortoise. So those were all considered unclean. In verse 30, the ferret, the chameleon, and the lizard, and the snail. So there goes escargot and the mole. Okay, so these were the unclean foods according to Levitical law. Now, of course, we're under the high priesthood of Jesus, under the you know, laws of Melchizedek, um, but this is, we're just looking at this face value at first. And God calls all these foods unclean and an abomination. In all, the word abomination is used 10 times 
in Leviticus 10, in Leviticus 11 alone, because these foods are associated with what is what God considers unclean. Now, all of this can give you pause, and it can make you wonder, you know, do I really want to eat a, bo- a bottom dweller, you know? Do I really want to eat some of these foods? And I don't blame you if you don't. It has nothing to do with your salvation. You know, I, I like bacon, and so I'm fine with that. I think, you know, there are, um, there's a freedom in Christ that we have. Um, but the problem begins when one side begins to condemn another over issues that are meant to be personal convictions under the new covenant. And so if there are brothers in the Lord that don't want to eat shrimp and want to follow these you know, food laws, so be it. Let them be. Romans 14, 20 says, For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things are indeed pure. Okay, let's repeat that. All things indeed are pure. Okay, so this goes two ways. If somebody wants to eat shrimp and bacon and lobster, let them be, and, and vice versa. It has nothing to do with our salvation, for meat destroy not the work of God. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. So if you're offended by it, then it's evil to you. And, you know, notice the word, all things are pure. So um, that takes care of the divisions that, you know, we shouldn't have divisions among each other. Now, the Hebrew Roots Movement does, uh, you know, go into where they really are, you know, want to compel people to follow these laws, and that's not right. Um, And I know there's a lot of workspace stuff going on in the the Hebrew Roots Movement. I'm not in any way defending the Hebrew Roots Movement. You know, we are under the New Covenant that's the name of our church, is New Covenant Baptist Church. You know, but um, when it comes to meat, you know, if there's a genuine believer who is not doing this for salvation to follow the law, they've put their faith in Jesus Christ by faith alone, and they don't want to eat shrimp, I'm not going to judge them, and, and vice versa. Um, but the final purpose, the real purpose, the spiritual purpose of the clean and unclean food list is to set or was to set God's people apart from non-believers to sanctify them, to consecrate them, to make them holy, to make a difference, the Bible says, between the unclean and the clean in Leviticus 11, 47. So the unclean refers to those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, in the Messiah, you know, which they didn't know his name at that point, but they were still worshiping him as we saw in all the sacrifices. Those would have been the clean. And God wanted to make a distinction between the clean and the unclean in his law. And so Leviticus 20, 25, later on in Leviticus, it says, "Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beasts or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. This was allegorical of God's people being set apart from the unbelieving Gentiles around them. All the lists are summed up by the last three verses in Leviticus 11, which starts at uh, verse 45. This really sums up chapter 11 and the purpose of, of these laws, which says, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. He was making a distinction between Egypt, between the world, and the people of God, the nation of Israel, which had just formed in the Sinai desert at that time. He was making a difference between the saved and the unsaved, the clean and the unclean. That's really all in all what these food laws were ultimately about. 46, this is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beasts that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. And so we see this explained 
in the New Testament, okay? You can't just read Leviticus 11 and leave it at that. You know, if you look in the New Testament, which is our final authority on all matters of the law. Now, the whole Bible is the Bible. The whole, you know, every word is the word of God. But, you know, if, the, if there's something in the New Testament that says, that overrides the Old Testament and says, you know, now all foods are pure. Now all things are pure. You know, then we go by that because there are specific instances where this was talked about. You know, um, there are even times when it said, lay not another burden on the Gentiles other than, you know, that they abstain from fornication and uh, blood and eating blood. So there were specific instances where in the New Testament they specifically um, said, we're free in Christ, you know, but follow these specific things, such as not drinking blood. Um, and this is because you have to remember the law of God, the Levitical law, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ himself, as we showed in the last sermon, and will continue to show when we get to the blood atonement um, in the next part of Leviticus. Now, we see this most clearly reflected in the book of Acts, chapter 10. So go ahead and turn to Acts, chapter 10. All right, so Acts chapter 10 deals with Peter and Cornelius. Okay, this is the, this is the passage where the apostle Peter um, is given a vision and goes to Cornelius the Roman centurion. And this clears up once and for all that all foods are clean according to the new covenant. So Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call one Simon, whose surname is Peter. This was the apostle Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, while they were preparing the, the food for him, he fell into a trance. Okay? And a trance is you're, you're awake, okay? But you fall into the state where you're having a, a vision. And in verse 11, and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great uh, sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, all manner, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. So every beast and fowl and creeping thing was in this vision from the clean to the unclean. They were all there. In verse 13, And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So Peter had never in his life broken the Levitical food laws. And in verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now there are two applications here. And we really have to look at both. You can't ignore one or the other. You know, the vision is of animals. God is a literal God. You know, even when there's symbolism, there's also a literal application, you know, in most cases, if not in, in, in well, I, I don't want to say every case, but in, in many instances. And so, you know, God says here, what God hath cleansed, that call not, call not thou common. So, First, again, on the practical level, on the everyday level, the animals, the unclean animals, God now calls clean. Okay, so that's why we have verses, you know, in the New Testament, which says, 
that all things indeed are pure, like such as Romans 14, 20. Um, so there's a correlation that happens within the New Testament. And, in, and the other application, of course, the spiritual application, just like Leviticus 11 had a spiritual application, is that now Gentiles, um, everybody, you know, the gospel has been opened up to every creature, to everyone that's living on the earth can now put their faith in Jesus Christ, you know, because Jesus came to, he was of the Jews, you know, he preached to the Jews first, and we looked at, in the book of Romans, um, in our Bible study, we looked at that, where, you know, he first preached the gospel, and once they rejected it, uh, the gospel was opened to the whole, to the whole world, and that was a part of God's plan. And in verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed thou call not thou common. So the Levitical law was fulfilled now in Jesus. The food laws were fulfilled. Everything has been fulfilled in Jesus. In verse 16, This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Three times this was repeated to make sure it was confirmed, you know, that Peter couldn't miss it. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. Or were lodged there. And so, you know, basically this goes on and, and Cornelius ends up getting saved. And the gospel is opened up to every creature and all the foods are now pure. Colossians 2, uh, starting at verse 16, says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay, so we see this, a plain statement from the New Testament. You know, you know, a pastor that we admire has said, you know, if you don't want to fall into false doctrine, base your doctrines on plain statements from the Bible. You know, you don't take a proverb and make a doctrine out of it, you know, and we can get into that another time. But this is a plain and clear statement from Paul. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day. So this goes both ways. We're not to judge each other when it comes to meat and drink. Mark 7, uh, starting at verse 14. It's, uh, this is a passage with Jesus that also confirms this. Uh, starting in verse 14, Mark 7. And when he had called all the people unto him, speaking of Jesus, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Okay, so there's nothing that we can take inside of us that defile us, that make us unclean. It's what comes out. It's the railings. It's the attacks on Christian brothers. It's the false accusations. It's the lies that are being preached from the pulpits and from you know Christian brothers and sisters that defile the man. It's not what you take inside of you that defiles the man. This is what Jesus said. You know, it's a much greater sin to rail against someone than it is to you know debate over doctrine, over church government, over anything else. You know, it's it's how we're supposed to treat each other is the bigger issue. We're to you know we're to love one another as Christians. Christians are meant to be known by their love, okay? When we go and rail against people, we shouldn't rail against anyone, but when we mark, you know, when we mark someone as a false teacher, as a false prophet, it's talking about salvation, okay? It's talking about marking those who are perverting the gospel, all right? It's not talking about, you know, going after your brothers um, who you're supposed to love. First Timothy 4, starting at verse 4 through 5. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So again, the food laws were meant for a purpose of signifying the clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy. It was meant as a consecration of God's people. 
And so, you know, if you go to someone's house and they set pork before you, or they set shrimp before you, you know, pray, give thanks, and eat it. You know, that's that's my, you know, that's what this is saying. You know, it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So let's uh, move on to the final chapter for today, Leviticus 12. And we'll just uh, end with Leviticus 12. There is a lot in these three chapters, so we only covered three because there is um, a lot going on um, in these. So Leviticus 12 covers the purification laws for women after they have given birth. Okay, so <clears throat> Leviticus 12 is uh, such a short chapter. It's only eight verses. So let's just go ahead and read it. And we'll, uh, we'll finish up, um, you know, with just a few thoughts on Leviticus 12. Leviticus 12 describes how a woman is unclean after giving birth before, you know, for a set period of time. So this deals with the purification laws after giving birth. Um, so let's go ahead and read it. Leviticus 12. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. So that's the laws for a male child that's born. Okay, The, the number of days are... Um, different, actually, as you'll see, for uh, a male child versus a, a woman child. So it's seven days plus, and then you circumcise them on the eighth day, and then 33 more days for a total of 40 days of ritual purification for a male child. And in verse 5, but if she bear a, ma a made child, which is biblical word for a female, if she bear a male, a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation. So we see that seven is doubled to 14. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. So even that 33 days is doubled, exactly doubled to 66, making it a total of 80 days, which is exactly double for a male child. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath borne a male or female. So, why are the days doubled? Let's just look at that. Um, there are a lot of theories and conjecture as to why, um, and you can look them up. You know, none of them, a lot of them really didn't make a whole lot of sense, so I'm not going to go over all the ones I don't believe it is in this case, uh, but you, know, you can look that up. But I believe the simplest and the most biblical answer isn't sensitive to modern sensibility, which is that God was placing preeminence over the man versus the woman because of the woman's transgression in the Garden of Eden with the man being placed in a position of authority and leadership. Now, this doesn't speak in any way over the value of a, a, you know, a female, of a woman in any way. You know, we just talked about this um, that, you know, women are supposed to preach the gospel as much as men are to the lost. You know, now women don't stand up behind a pulpit and preach the gospel to the church, but they're supposed to preach the gospel to the lost. This is just signifying that the man is the leader, that the man has the, the final authority in that man-woman relationship. So by doubling that in the number of days, 
that's what it's sign- I believe that's what it's signifying. We also see in 1 Timothy 2, verse 13, it says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So she'll be redeemed, um, not spiritually, but physically, um, she'll be given value through childbearing and, and you know, procreating, recreating, um, and having children. So um, that's why I believe the number is doubled. It just simply, you know, symbolically speaks of the authority that a man has in that marriage relationship within the church, you know, and all of these things that we see throughout the Bible consistently. Um, now, Leviticus 12 is also important because it shows that Mary, the mother of Jesus, though blessed among women, had sin. Okay, and one of the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church is to elevate Mary, among many other sins, but and false teachings, you know, um, is, is to elevate Mary to a position of deity. And I've gone over this extensively in other sermons, but uh, they call this the Immaculate Conception, meaning that Mary was born in an immaculate or perfect state without the taint of sin or the inherent sinful nature that all humans are born with. Now, there are many verses that prove that this is a false doctrine, that the Immaculate Conception, referring to Mary, not Jesus, that she was conceived without sin is what they teach. There are many verses that prove that that's false, including Luke 147, where Mary herself says, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Because of course, if you have no sin, then you have no need of a Savior. And she wouldn't be calling Jesus Christ her Savior. But one of the passages in the Bible that also definitively proves that Mary was human and, you know, she she had within herself all that comes with being human is found in Luke 2, which refers back to our passage in Leviticus 12. Uh, Luke 2, starting at verse 21, and when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child... His name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So we see here it's the eighth day. She's gone through her seven days of purification according to the Levitical law. In chapter 12, it's the eighth day. Jesus gets circumcised. And in verse 22 of Luke 2, it says, And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we see this in the end of Leviticus 12, verse 7. Verse 7, Leviticus 12, 7, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement. Actually, let's back up to verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering, for a sin offering. So keep that in mind. Unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, So Mary was offering a sin offering because she had sin. She had to be purified. Uh, Verse 7, Who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath borne a male or a female. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. (coughs) And the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So, <clears throat> now, atonement obviously has to do with sin. <clears throat> so, we see that Mary followed the Levitical law of purification because she was not 
the immaculate, sinless mother of God, but the human mother of Jesus, who is very blessed. We should honor Mary. You know, she is handpicked by God himself, you know, but she did have a human nature. And so that concludes chapters 10 through 12 of Leviticus. And next time we're going to cover a few more chapters. We're going to cover, um, I'm hoping that, you know, unless I find a lot of detail in it um, that I want to be more extensive about. But basically I'm planning to cover chapters 13 through 17, which includes some of the laws of leprosy and various diseases. And, you know, don't worry, you know, we're not going to look at, there's three chapters on just on leprosy. And uh, we're not going to get that detailed in terms of, you know, we don't have a big leprosy problem in this church. So we're not going to have to go over every extensive, you know, nuance of the leprosy laws. But we, we might look at, um, you know, some of the examples of Jesus healing the lepers and what that, you know, signifies in terms of the atonement um, of being cleansed and how it's really a prelude to, to Christ's cleansing for our own sins as we get into the once per year. This was the, the all-important, you know, once per year blood atonement of, of Jesus, of the Messiah, of the Lamb of God at that time um, in chapter 16. And we'll look at 17 hopefully as well. So a lot of part three is going to cover that blood sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Um, which is really important to understand because it helps defeat, you know, the blood sacrifice helps defeat every workspace gospel in existence. Um, once you understand that you are saved only by the blood of Jesus and not through any kind of work, that it's that blood atonement that sacrifices for sins as we've, we've been looking at all of these different sacrifices um, in the beginning of Leviticus. So with that, let's uh, close in prayer and uh, we'll be on our way. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a great uh, service today. Let us fellowship now with one another and, and have a blessed Sunday. And uh, we thank you for the truth from your word, God. <clears throat> we thank you from the, for the truth from your word and that you bless us and bless this church and bless everyone here and everybody that's, um, that's listening, and we thank you, God. We praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.